Hey everyone, um, hope you're all having a good conference so far and learning a lot about observability. Um, my name is Dan Norris, I'm here with my colleague uh, Jonas Burgess, and we are here to talk to you about observability at the edge, uh, instrumenting WebAssembly with open telemetry. Um, so to lead us off, I just wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of what we'll be discussing kind of for the next like 20-25 minutes. Um, so first off, uh, my colleague is going to give you an overview of WebAssembly in case you're not familiar with it. Um, and a brief introduction to Wasm Cloud, which is a CNCF, um, hopefully soon to be incubating um, project that we happen to work pretty closely with. Um, and then I'll go into sort of the more nitty gritty details of why we decided to um, implement open telemetry, why now, what our kind of journey to get there looked like. Um, and then specifically get into um, how we ended up implementing support for OTEL, um, uh, tracing uh, logs and metrics. Um, and then we'll end it off with kind of future work and where we think uh, things will be going with these integrations. All right. Um, so before I kind of go into what is WebAssembly, I just want to quickly survey the room to see how many of you have heard of WebAssembly. Can I get a, like, just a quick show of hands? Okay. okay. We've got some people. Uh, how many of you are using WebAssembly in production or just playing around with it, like actually using it day to day? I've got a handful. Okay. Cool. All right. That's good. So. Um, I, I guess just for, for everybody else, um, first, just for your edification, a little bit about what, like what is WebAssembly and why should you care about it. Um, so WebAssembly is a um, binary code format that's designed for executing programs. Um, it was originally designed for the browser. Um, the idea was that as applications in the browser start getting bigger and bigger, uh, they start to slow down. Right? There's some just limitations that we're going to run into with uh, JavaScript alone. Uh, so. The idea was that what if we could bring more performant languages into the browser, things like Rust, C, Go, um, and actually be able to run those programs inside of uh, the browser. Um, so there's some interesting properties that came out of that. Um, the idea was that you, we'd get a target environment where you can write the software once, and then uh, you could run that software anywhere where WebAssembly is a uh, runtime, where WebAssembly runtime is available, but also. Uh, as, as you probably all know, browsers tend to be, or the internet tends to be kind of a hostile environment. So um, the security model that WebAssembly has adopted uh, is kind of the, almost like the polar opposite of containers. So um, if you're familiar with running containers, you typically tend to take permissions away from the containers to secure it. But in the case of WebAssembly, uh, the, actually the, the model is such that you add capabilities only for the things that you want the program to be able to do. So out of the box, the program can do actually nothing at all with the outside world. So it has no interaction ability to interact with things. But you as the person deploying the software actually get to define like, hey, this needs to be able to talk to a certain file or fi things on the file system, uh, but not anything else. So that's kind of a really interesting property. And those are the kinds of things that we as it turns out, are very helpful for also the, not just the browser world, but also on the server side. And, and furthermore, um, WebAssembly applications are, compared to containers, for example, are tiny. So um, a WebAssembly program, actually a demo that we've been showing around here was uh, one of the components in that is just 700 kilobytes when it's compiled to WebAssembly, uh, as opposed to, you know, a couple gigs of a container, right? So it has some really interesting properties from that standpoint. Um, one of the interesting kind of like adding on to the interesting things from WebAssembly. Uh, there's a theme here that I, you might be picking up on. Uh, WebAssembly also has this idea of components. So uh, what you can do is you can basically compose programs, WebAssembly components, uh, programs, sorry, um, built in different languages. Uh, so WebAssembly components allow you to essentially define an interface for exports and imports of what your WebAssembly program does or needs to work function. And then you can connect those programs written in different languages. So in this case, we have a uh, WebAssembly module written in Rust that's exposing some functionality. It's like a library. And then we have another component written in Go that's actually importing that functionality and using it as part of the running the program. So uh, this is all possible because of the interface that's used for uh, composing these things together. Uh, so that's a pretty cool uh, thing that you can do. Uh, now, you might be wondering, OK, that seems interesting, but how do I actually deploy this, right? It's not like they're just containers and you could ship them on Kubernetes here, off you go. Well, that's where CNCF Wasm Cloud actually comes in. So Wasm Cloud was designed to be an application platform for running uh, WebAssembly components uh, in a distributed fashion. Uh, so the idea is that whenever, wherever you can run um, 
a WebAssembly runtime, specifically in our case, WASM time, uh, whether it's in the cloud, on the edge, on a small device that you might have in your house, uh, you should be able to deploy WebAssembly components there. Um, and the way we accomplish this, uh, or I guess the furthermore, what we allow you to do then is those components that might be deployed in different locations can seamlessly talk to each other, send RPC calls, because underlying all of this, we have something called NATS, which is another CNCF project that basically in, uh, acts as a interop, like a message bus, bus uh, behind the scenes. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, kind of just to wrap up what the takeaway from all that is, um, because WebAssembly uh, has this like target environment where it's like you just compile it down to a byte code and then you can ship it and run it anywhere. Uh, you know, WebAssembly essentially allows you to target all sorts of new environments that you might have had not had to have available to you before. Uh, and then specifically Wasm Cloud itself, what it does is it kind of step uh, steps up that by making it possible for you to take these WebAssembly components and distribute them globally across the world. Uh, and have those components talk to each other without necessarily knowing where they might be running. Cool. So that was a pretty good overview of sort of like the what and contextualizing kind of what, where this is coming from. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking to you about the how and the why. So um, as Jonas mentioned, there's uh, all this web assembly kind of has to run somewhere. And so we call that the Wasm Cloud Host. Um, and that is the program that um, is responsible for running all of these WebAssembly components. Um, and so you can think of it kind of like a kubelet in the Kubernetes world, right? It's um, just a program that's kind of sitting around waiting to be invoked um, by, you know, some sort of scheduler or orchestrator for the most part or in individual um, control commands to basically start some workloads, stop some workloads, update them, right? Make sure everything's still running and kind of keeping going. Um, so again, very much kind of like a kubelet to make that analogy. Um, and normally I wouldn't mention this because it's kind of trivia, but it's actually kind of important for some of the things that we're going to be talking about here is um, that whole project is written in Rust. Um, and so that has been interesting to say the least, particularly with um, kind of adding observability through OTEL. Um, we in particular use the uh, OTEL Rust SDK and also the um, uh, tracing ecosystem that comes in from the Tokyo project. I'm not sure how many Rust stations are in the crowd, but Tokyo is kind of how you do, it's almost like the canonical way to do async code. Um, and so the SDK, kind of like SDKs in other languages, you know, Go, C, Java, whatever, um, is mostly responsible for providing a lot of those types and also giving the client capability to be um, an actual OTEL exporter. Uh, whereas the tracing crate, which is kind of unique more to the Rust ecosystem, um, is actually kind of how we end up doing a lot of the instrumentation. Uh, it ends up uh, providing us all the macros that we kind of like decorate um, our individual functions with. Um, and so it, it's really handy because we can automatically um, do span propagation um, and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, unlike, you know, something like Go where all that's sort of just attached to a context or whatever. Um, but that call comes in through a completely separate library that is not actually provided by Otel. Um, and so really the takeaway is you actually do need both if you are uh, writing or intending to use OTEL with Rust. So that's kind of just like a pro tip. Um, but kind of for, as like a meta point, like why did we decide to go with open telemetry, right? Um, I'm sure many of us in this audience, right, are pretty much already sold on every, all things observability. Um, but we ended up going with OTEL in particular, right, um, precisely because it is a single standard, right? It encompasses all of the signals, so traces, metrics, logs, um, that most of us who are operating production systems really care about. Um, you know, having that really enables a whole bunch of functionality down the line, and you don't really have to worry about, you know, the implementation changing out from under you. Uh, it also is nice because kind of inherent in the spec and the philosophy uh, is that we decouple the source of our telemetry from what is receiving it, right? This whole notion of being able to, you know, in your client or, uh, you know, in our case, this host code, um, being able to uh, instrument all of our code, you know, with tracing or whatever, um, and being able to export that to just some sort of a collector, a thing that implements a standard, um, is really, really helpful, especially in a world where that we happen to interact in where um, these hosts can be running anywhere, right? They could be in a Kubernetes cluster in Amazon. They could be running on some Barrett Metal in some Colo. They can be on some Raspberry Pi that's running in someone's closet or underneath their bed. Like, we don't know. Um, it could be on an ESP32 in theory. 
So like, you know, like a little tiny development board. Um, so being able to handle that effectively, even when it comes down to the telemetry layer, is really, really interesting. You know, um, customers or consumers can decide that, you know, they want to do a bunch of processing sort of in line before they send it out, right? They could ship them to, you know, big, massive collectors that kind of live in their data center and then ship those out to, you know, downstream ETL systems. Who knows? But it's nice to be able to sort of ship that off and not be bound to, say, a particular collector implementation like a Fluent or a, a Vector, like great projects. Don't get me wrong, we use them. But it's nice to be able to kind of abstract that a little more. Um, and the other benefit really is that there's just an enormous ecosystem that's started to spin up in the hotel community. And that just continues to be, evolve and improve and add additional functionality. So we as people who are contributing to an open source project can continue to take advantage of all that whole evolution. Uh, so we've been kind of working toward this for a while, actually. Um, we started probably backwards in some ways to probably how most people might approach this, but we actually started implementing distributed tracing, um, specifically uh, May of 2022. Um, and the reason that we sort of settled on that was because we realized as we were building out WebAssembly um, applications for the company that we work at, Cosmonic, um, but also for our customers and people who are in the uh, Wasm Cloud ecosystem, we realized that because of the way that these distributed um, applications are being built, um, it was hard to debug, right? It's hard to understand what was going on. It was hard to be able to visualize it. So uh, we realized that distributed tracing in particular made it really, um, or much, much easier to be able to understand what's going on, to be able to, to diagnose issues in production, be able to see kind of under and understand at a glance where these call stacks are kind of flowing. So we decided to start there. Um, also, kind of as a historical note, um, at the time, since that was a while ago at this point, uh, metrics, the latches and logs APIs, and the, someone will probably correct me on this, but I know the logs one in particular was like barely kind of spec'd out at the time. Metrics might, I don't think it was even an alpha yet. Someone probably knows the actual dates on that. Um, but anyway, they weren't stable, right? There, it, was, it would have been a risk for us to sort of take that on. Um, and in particular with logging, since that's sort of been such a core thing from observability anyway, like we, us logging the standard out and shipping that over, um, in our case, we were actually using a lot of vector in production, um, we already solved that problem. So we felt that, you know, distributed tracing was good enough to start. We would work with it as the standard evolved. And so um, we've actually recently revisited that. Um, Wasm Cloud is um, pretty imminently going to hit um, 1.0, and so we decided it was time, you know, now that things had evolved in the community and we um, really wanted to make sure that for a 1.0, we included um, all of the observability that, uh, you know, S3Es or anybody operating these systems would want. So we did decide to implement metrics and logs uh, earlier this year. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of like um, each of the individual signals and kind of how we did end up implementing them and some of the nuances of some of the decisions that we made there. Um, so I'll start with tracing. Um, so, uh, Jonas alluded to this um, before, but um, core to Wasm Cloud and kind of that project is that, you know, these WebAssembly components, these really lightweight kind of ephemeral things, um, actually all communicate via RPC, um, using NATs as kind of like a way to abstract the network, um, which is great. Like, it makes it really like, easy to run. Stuff kind of knows what to talk to you basically by like topic or address, right? Uh, but what that means is anytime you want to invoke one of these components or anytime one of these components is reacting to some sort of an event, um, we need to be able to propagate span and trace IDs, just like any other system. Like, you know, if you're writing a little Go program that um, is handling HTTP requests, right? Like, you're handling th that automatically if you're using the SDKs. Um, but with, since we're kind of going through this third party, uh, we had to figure out how to do that. And so the answer that we settled on um, was similar in some ways. Uh, we uh, have the ability, um, using this NATS project, um, to set arbitrary headers on a message. So very similar to what you would do and what actually, um, how spans are propagated like in HTTP. Um, we can attach you know, key value pairs of strings to each message just as header metadata. And um, what's nice about that is the Rust SDK um, for OTEL um, has a, an extractor trait, and for anyone who's not sort of um, as big of a station out there, a trait is kind of like an interface in some ways, similar to Java, Go, right? It's kind of a description of, um, you know, the various functions you need to implement, but then 
libraries can consume that and just call the interface and it's all good, right? It's called trait and rest. Um, so we implemented that trait uh, and it turns out as we were kind of doing some research um, in the ecosystem, right, Kafka in, um, inherent and in it's like implementation of Hotel actually does something very similar. So it was kind of nice to be able to use that as inspiration and use what, kind of what we were uh, able to do through the SDK. Um, so it's nice because that means the host handles all this. It's not even something a consumer or anybody who's trying to write these applications even needs to worry about. Um, so an example of what this might look like, um, this is actually a Nats message, like um, just running the CLI kind of subscribed to a topic to kind of dump out all of the, the payloads basically. Um, and so most of it is kind of, you know, not that interesting. Um, what I have highlighted um, in yellow down here is actually um, all of the headers on this message. So in this case, um, all it really has is the span and trace IDs. That's what the tra transparent key is. Um, if, you've prob if you've ever unpacked um, OTEL HTTP headers, shouldn't be surprised. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, but our extractor actually is able to, anytime it receives a message, right, um, know that it basically needs to propagate, you know, the trace, instantiate a span, kind of be able to handle, like, actually um, ha all that, met that data, right, and propagate it outwards. Um, and then there's a JSON payload, but that part isn't that interesting, at least for this. Um, and so, example of this kind of working, right, I pulled this out of um, Honeycomb, actually, just out of one of our production systems. Um, I don't expect you to read it. It is very small, right, part of that's uh, deliberate, mostly to give you a sense of the fact that um, there's a lot of colors on here. Those colors are individual spans. These spans can be very, very deep actually in this system because everything's kind of traversing um, NATs and kind of everything's kind of cross-talking all the time, which is good and bad um, because unfortunately there are some limitations to Hotel right now with Wasm. Um, and in particular is like, unlike maybe some systems that you probably have worked with with distributed tracing, um, with WebAssembly right now and the runtimes that exist, um, it's kind of an open research question actually as to um, how you support tracing within the, the context of an individual function. So um, in our case, like our traces actually end right at that call to the component. So you know how long it took, but you don't know what it did or what the function you were actually invoking. You know, just know you made a call and that call did something. So this is actually just a blown up view of, you know, one of the, um, parts of that trace that I just showed you. Um, and so you can see where the invocations are happening and then we make a call. Um, and what's cool about that call is it's 81.8 microseconds, which is pretty fast. I'll take that. Um, but I don't know what that is, right? It could be doing anything. So I don't really have the context, but you kind of have to build that up through understanding sort of what your system is doing. But as it turns out, yes, that's a limitation and yes, there's ongoing work. Um, but we have found it's actually still good enough, even in that current state, um, to really help diagnose issues in production, just like you would in any other uh, system that you might be using distributed tracing with. Um, but again, the downside is that you get these really deep call traces. So um, what we've learned kind of a pro tip in this situation, which if you've worked with tracing is probably not a surprise, is that you have to sample. Like you, you just do not have a choice unless you really, really like paying your um, observability vendor if you happen to be one or using one a lot of money or spending a lot of money on storage for Amazon like th I mean they're cool with that but I doubt you are um, so uh, it, and again it's kind of just a consequence of running these distributed systems but what's nice about Otel is that because these collectors are so flexible um, it has tail sampling so you can kind of do that on your own and as somebody who is consuming this data you can decide how much of it you want to keep how much of it you want to throw away you know, how much of it do you really need at any given time to be able to understand the boundaries of your system. Uh, so let's talk about logs. Um, and again, because this, a lot of this is particular to Rust, um, it turns out it's actually really straightforward if you've done distributed tracing. Like with Hotel, it turns out um, to enable tracing is like 90% of the work if you've already gone through it. Because if you think about what a log is, it's just kind of an event and distributed traces are events and so the, um, tools that we already kind of have at our disposal already give you almost everything that you need. Um, so in uh, our case, it was really just enabling some additional configuration to actually send those logs to an hotel remote endpoint that actually supported logging. Um, and really the, the hardest part about this was more just there's some nuances in the SDK that made it kind of, the code is a little not great. Um, when you're initially con configuring the exporter, 
um, and structured logging. So that, it wasn't that bad. Um, and talk about metrics. Um, if anybody has implemented um, metrics with Prometheus, like actually instrumenting you know, code and adding counters and whatnot, it's kind of the same thing if you look at it, right? A lot of the data types are kind of the same. Um, the loop's pretty simple as you're sort of working through that mental flow chart. You know, you find a thing you want to instrument, you decide on the type of metric that you care about, you know, is it a counter, is it a gauge, histogram, whatever, um, and then you, you know, you modify it, you increment it, you decrement it, whatever. And so in our case, well, um, what we had to figure out was what does it look like to add additional metadata? Um, and so, again, if you've worked with something like Kubernetes and you've looked at, like, what those metrics look like, you know that there's, prob there's things that get included in every metric, like a pod ID and a namespace, things to actually segment and know, um, you know, this metric actually applies to this application running at this particular point in time. We realized early on we had to do the same thing. Um, you know, we need to include some sort of machine identifier um, and what we call a lattice ID, which is basically a namespace. Um, and so we needed to be able to include that so that they were distinguishable. Um, Hotel does have some sort of like top level metadata constructs namely resources and instrumentation scope. Um, resources in particular are cool because it's kind of like top level metadata of things that you want to include. Um, and the problem is they don't automatically end up in labels without doing a bunch of work. Um, and instrumentation scope, pretty useful. It's kind of like ways to sort of identify like this is how I logically partition parts of my program. Um, but we learned that at least in the SDK that we're using, it wasn't really easy to get that data. So we had to figure out something else. And so what we chose to do was include those labels on every metric just in our code. Lotter wrote some functions to kind of decorate all that. Um, but that was kind of a philosophical choice, right? We decided to do that because we wanted um, our downstream consumers to be able to aggregate all of that or get rid of it or really leave that up to the control of the collector to be able to um, decide how they wanted to aggregate or not. Um, opting in, like there's a way you can do this specifically with the Prometheus exporter, there's actually a flag you can set to take resources and add them automatically on labels, which we thought was a really good idea, but we realized it's optional. So it meant like downstream consumers would have to know that that's an option that you have to enable in order to get meaningful metrics. Like that wasn't going to fly. We'd rather give you too much data and have you decide that you want to throw it all away than to ha make you um, figure this stuff out and just become an expert. It just didn't make sense. All right, so that's uh, a lot of about how we went about it. Uh, now, there's a few things, uh, just to kind of wrap things up, uh, there's a few things that we're really excited for uh, in terms of future work. Um, I, I know that there's uh, active work happening around the continuous profiling space and introducing that as a signal. So we're hoping that once that becomes more formal thing in the open telemetry space, we could just leverage that by adding an integration in, into Wasm Cloud. Um, then, as Dan mentioned, there's some function level tracing that we don't currently have access to, but the good news is that in the WebAssembly space, um, there's a WASI standard, uh, which is, uh, we don't have time to get into WASI standards here, but there's a, essentially a standard, there's a group working on introducing a standard that will allow you to uh, add function level tracing inside of uh, your WebAssembly components uh, as long as the runtime itself supports that standard. And then finally, um, something we'd like to actually implement across our entire project is uh, ensuring we have open, uh, the open telemetry semantic conventions being followed, because uh, if you're coming from a different system where you might be uh, used to those semantics, it'd be really nice to be able to just take that, uh, you know, use the same things that you're already used to from elsewhere and just apply that same knowledge in, in uh, our measuring our, our metrics. So uh, with all that said, um, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, we have a booth uh, on the on the solution showcase at the back in the startup area, uh, K37. So come come on by. We'd be happy to tell you more about WebAssembly. Um, we also have a the Wasm Cloud project itself has a CNCF being a CNCF project has a a slot on Wednesday from three to five in the project pavilion. So or sorry, three to eight. So we'd love to have you there as well. And finally, if you are interested in learning more about WebAssembly components, uh, our, one of our colleagues, uh, Brooks Townsend, and then uh, Michael Yuan from uh, Was the Wasm Edge project in the CMCS space are running a tutorial that the QR code we have here uh, will will put you put you on your calendar. Uh, and then, if you want to learn more about uh, Wasm Cloud itself, uh, we would encourage you to check out our docs uh, on wasmcloud.com, and then uh, the instrumentation work or the setup that we have set up for the project for you to be able to easily kick the tires on this stuff is available in our GitHub as well. So with that, thank you very much.